In the first half of our South America cruise, we sailed south from Valparaiso, Chile, through the Chilean fjords and Strait of Magellan, winding down to Ushuaia, Argentina, taking a tour through the Tierra del Fuego National Park. The park's seemingly endless, dramatically beautiful landscapes of mountains molded by the Earth's tectonic plates and lakes carved by Ice Age glaciers were a real highlight of the trip. Our final stop in the park took us to the shore of the Beagle Channel, named for the HMS Beagle that carried naturalist Charles Darwin around the world. An island in the channel used to hold the southernmost post office in South America. In the pre-airmail era, ships would stop there to receive and send correspondence. The end of the world post office was privately run as a tourist stop, but it's also closed due to the deteriorated structure. Our tour dropped us back in town. The world's southernmost city, Ushuaia was founded in 1884 as a penal colony and logging town. Modern economic activities are fishing, sheep farming and tourism. The winds here are strong and pretty much constant. Even grounding these seagulls for a while. The city also has the world's southernmost commercial airport. The winds make it one of the most challenging places to land in the world. Back on the ship by dinner time, we watched the sun set over the southern Andes Mountains before sailing overnight back into Chilean waters toward Cape Horn on the southern tip of South America. Rough seas greeted us at dawn as we approached this lonely, rocky Chilean outpost. First charted and rounded in 1616 by Dutch sailors, they named it for their hometown, Hoorn. The raging winds and churning waters of the Atlantic meeting the Pacific make this area particularly hazardous and this albatross-shaped monument honors the countless sailors who lost their lives here. We were joined at the Cape by a Norwegian ship that we had seen docked with us in Ushuaia, named for Ruel Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer who led the first successful expedition to the South Pole. It was on its way farther south to Antarctica. But we had reached the southern terminus of our journey and turned back north. We had another sea day up to our next port of call. But there was plenty of onboard activity to keep us busy. There had been entertainment in the main theater the entire cruise. But we had picked up a special act in Ushuaia, professional dancers from Buenos Aires who specialized in tango, and they put on two spectacular shows. Tango was born in the late 19th century working class communities around the port of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Influenced by European immigrants and former African slaves, it was initially looked down on by the upper classes, but it's become one of the most celebrated dance forms in the world. A branch called Malambo developed with elements of the gaucho cattlemen of Argentina's interior. The 
dancers also give a free lesson in the ship's grand foyer. Our next port was Puerto Madryn, a coastal city of 100,000 built in a large, naturally sheltering gulf named Golfo Nuevo, or New Gulf. The city itself is small, but connected by sea, bus, and air to the rest of Argentina. We arrived early on a Saturday morning, so everything in town was quiet and mostly closed. Though some residents were out and about, and later on stores started opening up. There are a few touristy sites, including a mural of the most human of the gods, national football hero Diego Maradona. There's also a significant monument to the Fallen of the Malvinas, a set of islands in the South Atlantic off the Argentinian coast. Las Malvinas, the Falkland Islands to English speakers, was the center of a brief but brutal conflict in 1982 that I remember watching footage of on TV. Part of the Spanish Empire and then Argentina until the British seized them in 1833, Argentina still considers them part of their territory, despite the failed 1982 attempt to retake them. Many sons of Puerto Madryn were killed in the fighting. Many passengers also walked into town, some getting tours from vendors, but I just stayed in the city and enjoyed the ocean front. The Malecon is simple but extensive. And while the beach definitely isn't the nicest, there were some flamingos hanging out. I spent time on the pier watching turns fishing. And hanging out with other turns, seagulls and cormorants. A sea lion was getting some sun having climbed up from the water, and when I came back, he'd made room for some company. But the highlight was the penguins. Penguins were number one on our list of animals to see on this cruise, and they were just here a couple hundred meters from the boat. While I was in town, a Vic took a bus tour south to Punta Tombo, a small, rocky peninsula with a penguin rookery, and they were everywhere. The penguins around Puerto Madryn are Magellanic penguins, some of the most north-ranging, and Punta Tombo is one of their key breeding areas. This time of year though, breeding was over and it was molting season. And this one wasn't happy about it at all. Guanaco, a relative of camels and llamas, lived among the penguins, eating the grass and brush. The animals are well isolated from tourists, though there's always one nonconformist and you can still get pretty close to them. Back on the ship and continuing north, we were blessed that night with a gorgeous sunset and simultaneous moonrise. One last sea day was ahead of us, and the weather was fantastic. The best pool day of the entire cruise. 
After one last sunset in the open ocean, morning saw us pulling into Montevideo, the capital city of our milestone 50th country, Uruguay. Montevideo was established in 1723, relatively late in the European colonization of South America. Initially built as a military outpost to guard the much larger port of Buenos Aires, it grew rapidly in the 19th century and still retains much of that architecture. Historically pulled between its larger neighbors, Argentina and Brazil, Uruguay has nonetheless become a 21st century model for economic and political stability in South America, though many parts of the city are still very run down. The old town is small and walkable with beautiful squares, parks, and a long waterfront. The port market is a popular spot for cruise passengers, as it's adjacent to the port, and its design and restaurants are interesting but be prepared for tourist prices. We just sampled some of the local fare from a convenience store. We didn't know much about Uruguay prior to our arrival, but we did know about the 1972 Uruguayan plane crash in the Andes, and there was a museum about it just off of Constitution Plaza. Chartered Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 departed Montevideo on October 12, 1972, carrying a rugby team to a match in Santiago, Chile. Bad weather in the Andes forced them to land in Mendoza, Argentina, where they took off the following day. More bad weather and an inexperienced pilot resulted in a deadly crash in the Andes on October 13, and the survivor's incredible story has become immortalized in at least two movies. The museum has a lot of information and artifacts on the crash, but to protect the integrity and value of their collection, they don't want inside photographs distributed on the internet. But the recent Netflix Society of the Snow is an excellent reenactment. The final leg of our cruise was a short hop to Buenos Aires, but as it's one of the busiest channels in the world, it took a full night to travel about 120 nautical miles. In 13 days, we had sailed 3,720 nautical miles from Valparaiso down to Cape Horn and north again. And morning in Buenos Aires was the end of our cruise. But not the end of our Argentine and South American adventures. So be sure and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on our upcoming videos.